I am somebody. I am somebody. I am a king. King. I have self-worth. I have self-worth. If it is to be, it is to be. It is up to me. You know, one of the quotes that kind of undermines the confidence of you know, Frederick Douglass' quote is, easy to raise healthy boys in a big broken man. The idea is optimal health for black men. And that covers so many things, as Dr. Hunter pointed out. It's um, definitely covers the nine areas that uh, Dr. Wilson always talks about, economics, race, religion, sex, or uh, education, entertainment, you know, all those kind of things. And so health is not just about whether you're eating your fruits and vegetables, uh, which is a wonderful thing, but um, it's so much built into it. And I think that uh, is underlined by that and PTSD and, and, and uh, a lot of things that we're suffering from, um, but we're looking to heal from. What I'm trying to do with this talk, and it's going to be kind of, kind of um, an overview, is to kind of describe why it is we need healthy, mature black men so that we can defend our families, communities, nation, race, as you will. Okay. So, some ideas. Gentrification and black lives. So we did a series um, in D.C. and called, we called it Education or Incarceration. We had a couple of presenters, and some of the ideas that we were sharing had to do with the, um, of course, huge influx of, of our young men going to prison over the last, I don't know, 50 years. It's unprecedented. And so many of us see it, but kind of feel paralyzed. So these are said, let's start talking about it. So we did a couple of these in DC. Um, this brother here, Khalil Abdul, did a whole piece on prison privatization. It was very profound. Um, again, some of the money, I'll talk about that a little bit later. And um, we showed a film called The House I Live In. Anybody seen that one? House I Live In is a, is a really powerful documentary about um, what's going on with some of our young men in prison and young women in some of the communities and almost like how there's theater systems. Um, we did another one, Nikichi Taifa, a local activist who's been involved in like a lot of struggles, especially with people like political prisoners like, like Martha E. Conway. And then of course Dr. Winbush gave us this um, really wild one, preventing youth incarceration when there's no more cotton in the pit. That's a tough one. And we had a great turnout. There was one of the brothers in there who kind of spoke up and said, you know, we have to encourage our young men to take care of themselves first and foremost. He's just been very diligent about having these things in Howard, um, throughout Washington, D.C., and he asked me to host this one today. Um, just dealing with topics, and this one specifically with black men and some of the things that we go through. Um, the Institute at Morgan that I direct is dedicated to being a place where these ideas can be freely discussed. So I'm going to talk about images of black men first. Let's push this button here. Okay, let's repeat because most of you know this from me and quote. To say it out loud. If you do not, if you do not if you understand, understand my supremacy, racism, what it is and how it works, everything else you think you understand will only confuse you. Uh, Tom Burrell in his book, um, his name of his book, somebody else. Brainwashed. Brainwashed, talks about there's been a 500 year uh, advertising campaign to make black men and black women look a certain way. We came together as a male collective because there was about 25 years ago certain issues that were um, problematic in the black community. In other words, it was a drug. Uh, wars that were um, folks shooting uh, at each other, killing each other, all kinds of dysfunctional, disruptive, uh, enabling strategies um, coming out of, um, coming to um, confuse people um, after the black power struggles in which people were trying to be African, embracing African, but this was undermining all of that. So we came together as men to um, provide an alternative to our uh, intervention to what was not there, and that was uh, um, that there was a, a, a need for a systematic way in which we were going to socialize African youth. As a fundamental community educational process that's distinct from the academy, and so if you go through K through 12 uh, education, and, and you know, we're here at Morgan, uh, you know, an institution of higher learning, um, you're not gonna get rites of passage. And so rites of passage has to be owned as a community educational process where we are going ahead and very intentionally socializing and shaping our children to realize a higher purpose 
than the purpose that this society is reducing our children to be. And so let us be clear, in fact, I would dare say that more times than not, going through K through 12 and even higher uh, institutions of higher learning like this, you might be miseducated, like Carter G. Woodson uh, talked about almost a, a century ago, huh? And so then we need to then begin with that as the starting point. And so if we're clear, as Africans, we came to America not on the Mayflower, we came to America in chains, and they have created institutions to keep us in chains, whether it's physically, with the number of black uh, folk that are in prison, or whether it's mentally, keep us in chains. And so if we understand that the systems that they have set up are keeping us in chains as our starting point, then the question, as, uh, as the elder just asked, are we serious enough to go ahead and start institutions that are going to deconstruct, uh, I think I heard Dr. Wimbush talk, talk about Naeem Akbar's book, The Psychological Chains and Images of Slavery, so that are we going to create institutions that are going to deconstruct the chains that have been put on our mind. Uh, in fact, I'll never forget the time I was arrested by the police. Uh, I was, you know, regular police terrorism. They were harassing me. Uh, in fact, they said they wanted, they arrested me because they didn't have my name in the computer and they needed a mugshot and some fingerprints. Mm. Um, and I was so upset. I was coming out of prison, I was coming out of jail. I didn't have my belt, because, uh, you know, they take your belt away and my shoelaces. And I just wanted to destroy something. And I called up, uh, Baba Adamola, and Baba Adamola got angrier than me to the point where he said, we're gonna take this to China. <laughs> and I was so blown back by that, I said, China, Baba, of all the things I'm thinking about doing. He was like, no, we need to get up in arms and take it to China. So I really appreciate the fact that these elders are always there for me, always uh, making sure that uh, they're, they're supporting me. So I greatly appreciate that. I want to say, Thank you very much. Um, I want to go fast. I want to talk about a young man that um, I just thought of before I got up here. Uh, his name was Trey Sean. Can anybody still hear me? Still hear me say Ashe? Ashe. Oh, you stronger than that. For 500 years, you can say stronger than that. Ashe? Ashe. Good. There was a young man by the name of Trey Sean. He came to me. Uh, he, I was teaching seventh grade. He was in the sixth grade. And he came to me one day crying, holding a book in his hand that his grandmother had given him. Now, uh, Trey Sean, uh, his grandmother was deaf, she was hard of hearing. And he came to me, this book was given to him by his grandmother, and he was crying because he just left out of his reading class, saying that he couldn't read at all. Right? He was sixth grade, couldn't read at all, and he said, all I want to do about Deshango is read this book. So I looked at the book, I said, hey, no problem. I was like, I'm about to go to lunch, but let's sit here, let's read the book. So we read the book together, no problem. I said, you know what, Treshawn? Tomorrow I want you to come back, I think every day, from now on, I want to read before you go to your lunch and before I go to my lunch. And he said, are you serious? You would do that? I said, absolutely. I said, but the thing is, the books we're going to read, we're going to pick out different varieties of books. And he was like, okay, that's cool. So then he would come in and I'd pick out, we'd read, uh, one book we were reading was called When We Ruled. Is anybody familiar with that book? Yes. It's not a small book. It's a thick book. But it's got excellent pictures in it, and it's a great explanation of what happened to us as a people. Do you understand that, Sasha? So every day from that point on, we read together. I look forward to it, I think, more than he did. It just took like 10 to 15 minutes. We sit there, I'd read, and I, I could see him getting better because I would stop reading different words, and he would grab that one word on the page. And he became more and more excited about it. Then the administration came to me, and they said, uh, you're keeping him late from lunch, so you can't do this anymore. I said, well, maybe I can meet with him after school. But then the English teacher came to me and said to me, um, you're reading him books that are not on his level. And he's starting to believe that he doesn't need to read books on his level. Within the next two and a half weeks, they had convinced Treshawn this wasn't a good school for him, and he, was, he left. So I didn't get a chance to see him anymore after that. But that's just one example of what I used to call the public fool system. Today I don't call it that anymore. I call it the public cesspool system. It is the worst thing destroying our children. And you have to, I repeat, have to get your children out of this public cesspool system immediately. So one of the things that I'll say is that, um, that uh, there's a process that uh, many of you, if not all of you are familiar with, and that is that the, the, the right process takes us uh, from birth, where we're giving an identity. When you, you have a name, a woman gives you a name with your name in the ceremony, you're no longer the it or the baby. You never say, go pick, it up or go pick him up or what have you. 
you know, and at some point when you receive your name, uh, you that is like your first initiation, the fusion of identity within your family and your community. So we begin as as children, but as the rights process moves on, the next stage for us as males, uh, and I'll talk about the male aspect very, very quickly, is that we're supposed to be being prepared for the warrior stage. And that is to be the protectors of our families and of our community. And then the next stage that we should be prepared for within this process is that of the housekeeper or home holder of sorts. And that is, every man should be being prepared to be somebody's husband <coughs> and somebody's father. And you see what happens now, is how the process goes, it sort of kind of puts itself. So as we become prepared for being householders, the next stage that we should all be being prepared for in this process is to be the elder. It's to be the elder, let us be the, the, the counselors and the teachers of our community. Dr. Copper, Baba Huizu, Dr. Winfrey, Dr. Hunter. At our age, we should have passed through the householders phase of stage. And we should have been prepared as this is the case in those societies around the world that have the rights process of knowing enough about society, politics, sociology, spirituality, life, sexuality, all the above, to be at the point where we are what? The elders within our community and our family. And that's what the rights process is supposed to be. Now, what, without the rights process, what do you see? You see uh, men and women with development of the leg. How do you know they have a development of the leg? They're 65 years old, dressing like they're 40. Or they're 40 years old, dressing like what? They're 17. There's nothing more hurtful than to see a 40 year old man with his hat on backwards and his pants below his behind. I'd like to just share some, some personal things. It has to do with, uh, and I think, uh, you know, Dr. Winbush uh, mentioned it as well as Father uh, Nile Brown mentioned it also about, you know, the importance of preparation, preparation for marriage, you know, preparation as a social change agent. And I, and I was fortunate, you know, in my upbringing to be prepared for marriage and to be prepared to be a social change agent. You know, the model being, uh, you know, my father, my mother, uh, my uncles, my aunts. You know, all that was important in my preparation, you know, before I even knew what the rites of passage was as a term, it, you know, was taking place in, in, in my life experience. In traditional Africa, when your child is born, you start saving up for their rites of passage. Because you know that if your child has not gone through rites of passage, they are not going to be eligible to be married to nobody. So rites of passage is, is a human development process. Baba Kofi taught that for every process there's a product. And what we have seen now is that the processes that we were using of cultural, in, cultural incorporation and the identity as a representative of your genetic line in a community that we have seen the boys that we were working with, uh, they were 10, 12, 15 years old, are now in charge of institutions. They are the doctors. They are on the way to being doctors. They are people who have stuff and who do stuff, who make things happen. So I look at this uh, gathering today, and while it seems like a few people what Dr. Hill mentioned, you see, there's a, this is not an arithmetic process. This is geometric, because each one of the persons here will take what they have learned, and they will become a beacon in their own social circle for this information. In his opening paragraph, Edward Bernays, who is considered the founder of modern day public relations, in his opening paragraph to his book, I believe published in 1923 or 1920 called Propaganda, he's very, he's very candid and explicit. And the first paragraph reads, the conscious, thank you my man, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. 
Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute and quote, what he called an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. So in other words, he's saying from the beginning, those who are really running things are forming an invisible government and propaganda is key to their method of maintaining their control over the rest of us. But being that, that, that we're talking about black youth and black male youth, black boys in particular, uh, we can't talk, we can't do this, I think, obviously, as, as others have and will attest without talking about hip hop and its role in all of this in the media environment. Very quickly, I talk about uh, Africans in America or new Africans or, or, or African descendants in America uh, along with trying to extend the tradition of internal colonialism or, or through colonialism. Uh, the idea that we are a nation within a nation, a captive nation at that, uh, and then try to apply those principles accordingly. So Bronson and I talk about the setting up of the colonial system. This is actually one of my favorite quotes in terms of media and what Bernard has says here. The setting up of the colonial system does not itself bring about the death of the native culture. Historic observation reveals, on the contrary, that the aim sought is rather a continued agony than a total disappearance of the pre-existing culture. This culture, once living and open to the future, becomes closed, fixed in the colonial status, caught in the yoke of oppression, both present and mummified. That's really deep, right? I really like the way you like both this. Both present and mummified, it testifies against its members. It defines them, in fact, without appeal. The cultural mummification leads to a mummification of individual thinking, end quote. So what we see when we talk about the commercial takeover of hip hop is this fixing it in a colonial status and has to testify against the very people that are producing it. Uh, Harvard management is also linked up with Clear Channel and Goldman Sachs. Clear Channel is linked up with Morgan Stanley and the Walt Disney Company. Clear Channel is linked up with Merrill Lynch and Northrop Grumman, the defense contractor. Um, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, which is uh, Warren Buffett's investment group. Uh, News Corp is connected to Comcast and Clearchip. So my point is, is that the, the number one radio network that targets our black youth with, with the worst forms of our, our cultural expression are linked up with all number of banking and military industrial complex entities, all I think making the point that they are all linked up with the common goal of assuring that whatever we're trying to build in this room never actually happens or doesn't have the appropriate impact. It's very slick how things are hidden in plain sight for us. Right. But a lot of times we don't get it. The Pied Piper of R&B is what this brother calls himself. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if you don't know the story of the Pied Piper, you can't put it into context, and basically we don't, get, we don't get what's being stated. And then we also miss you know, the charges, the allegations of child molestation and things of that nature. We don't get it. We don't see how it fits in. Right? And so when we're talking about what's taking place within the mind, because as far as I've come to understand, initiation and rites of passage programs, they target the mind, the focus, is to shift the perspective. It's the, the purpose is to impact the mind in such a way that the outlook of the individual that's going through the initiation of the rites of passage is now ha has been expanded to encompass more of reality than it did prior to the rites of passage or the initiation process. As co-founder of the Youth Resiliency Institute, one of the questions that I constantly ask is rites of passage for the purpose of what? One more time. Rites of passage for the purpose of what? what? Let me recall the name of Brother Angelo Dangerfield, brutally murdered, murdered in Cherry Hill. Age 21, murder unsolved. For the passage, for the passages, for the passages, for the passages of so many other young people who are not here today. Zacharias Hallback, organizer here in Baltimore, brutally murdered who's no longer here. So the question becomes, what criteria exists? What are the criteria that speaks to powerful rites of passage processes? And yes, rites of passage is more so a process than a program. So what I want to touch on quickly are a few criteria that speak to powerful rites of passage processes. Number one, culture and identity development is central. The importance of understanding healthy identity formation and how it takes place, where it takes place. Number two, the importance of place. In Baltimore, when I first arrived to be more from East Cleveland, Ohio, everyone said, do not go into Cherry Hill. Don't go there. So, of course, I went. And I found a site of resistance where you had black families who were rebelling against the status quo in Baltimore. 
Grandmothers offering summer programming for children in their basics who are effectively administering rites of passage. Many brothers in the cultural community and sisters say in Baltimore didn't even want to go when I invited them. It's too crazy over there. Holding ourselves accountable is very important and if we are going to provide rites of passage, when we go into a community, if you're not already situated, living in that community, understand that there's protocol that exists in that community. There's tradition. There are networks that must be tapped into in order to have an effective rights process. Number two, the use of ritual and ceremony. Our children are thirsty for ceremony and ritual. You see urban high, high, hieroglyphics throughout Baltimore where they're communicating the need, the urgings, to have some sort of initiation. Number four, intergenerational and co-ed. It amazes me how many individuals start rites of passage processes without even knowing the lineage of the process in that immediate city. How are you going to start a rites of passage process in Baltimore City, Tubman City, without knowing Baba Adamola, Mama Rashida, the legacy of Daryl Kennedy? It does not work like that. Another, I'm not going to go through all the criteria. All of these are listed on our website. But what is very important is also the importance of a connection to the natural world. There are watersheds throughout Baltimore City. And we take the young people who we've been working with for five years. You have to be very committed to working with young people before they even begin a rites of passage process. The parents have got to step up and demonstrate their will and committed to be there throughout the process. So we've been working with these young people for five years. And we love taking them into nature. A serenity garden run by the Kevin L. Cooper Foundation, Mama Greta Carter, who lost both of her sons to violence, has a garden. And just last week, we had Grandma Edna, and she reenacted a scene from the life of Harriet Tubman. And those young people look mesmerized. It was amazing how it transformed them. So the last point I want to touch on is the importance of recognizing the power of art within rites of passage processes. Oftentimes, we neglect the power of art. You go into any museum in one of the largest collections that those museums are going to have, specifically European museums, is that African art exhibition. The masks that you see that were used in traditional rites of passage processes, the guard, the dashikis, that were used in traditional rites of passage processes. So if you are going to start a rites of passage process or volunteer within a, an existing rites of passage process, it's important to, to touch base to recognize the living artists in that specific city, whether it's Abu the flute maker, Mama Kabibi, countless artists who are struggling, who are central in terms of providing a holistic process for the children, youth, and their families. Mentoring Male Teens in the Hood is a group mentoring program, and I've been doing it since 1996. We've helped over 3,000 young men in Baltimore City. A lot of what we do is, is around a typical meeting. We start with a prayer. We have a basic prayer. We have between 40 and 50 on any given Saturday. Our referrals come from Department of Juvenile Services. And again, I'm one of their critics. Social services, uh, group homes, and the school system. That's how the young people come. Nobody is forced to be there. We have different speakers that come in from different walks of life, different occupations, our young men can start to think early about what it is they want to do with their lives. We want them to be exposed and we want them to think. We want them to spend less time in front of television. Less time in front of television. We want them to be very careful to the things that they are listening to in the way of lyrics. I won't be redundant, you've heard much of it in presentations before mine. But much of that junk that they hear over and over and over again, it, it permeates the subconscious mind and makes them, in my humble opinion, 
go out and act out, whether it be disrespecting a young lady, uh, pushing poison, or something else that causes our penal systems uh, to run over. All, all of the presentations that I'm hearing, it just it gives me confirmation that I am doing the right thing. Uh, it's been very challenging and very, very difficult. Uh, this is our going into our 18th year. Um, before today, I always struggled. Uh, Dr. Winbush has been supportive and, and been in my ear about certain things, but I struggled with why it's so difficult to get funding if I'm trying to empower young men of color. And of course I read some things and, and heard some things, but hearing the presenters today has made it even more clear. Uh, people don't care for what I'm doing. Uh, holding rallies in the streets of Baltimore in front of juvenile justice facilities to say that we should not continue to lock young people up, uh, the majority of whom are nonviolent offenders, to continue to espouse that community and family services reduce delinquency, community and family services reduce delinquency far more effectively than the current reliance on institutions. Uh, the powers that be just don't want to hear that. Um, I brought some of our young men today. I want them to have an opportunity to share with you what they will. It's not scripted. Uh, Mhotep Simba. To be honest, when I initially joined, I really couldn't appreciate it. Um, <laughs> not less, as years went by, I grew up in age of maturity. With that, I started to value the lessons that were taught in the mentoring sessions, such as pull up your pants and pull up your pride. Or you have to be three times as good as our Caucasian counterparts. Because let's face it, it's a challenge to grow up as an African-American male in the United States. But that's not the news. Um, I was encouraged that there was nothing wrong with getting the finer things in life as long as you earn them legitimately and with integrity. Most of the speakers who came to share their professions and stories with us could afford most of the things myself and the other young kings wanted. Therefore, they were examples and role models to being able to afford what you liked in life the legitimate way. Wisdom I gained from the program is not only power, but also it is something that cannot be taken away from me. Another lesson I gained was to look a man in the eye and give him a firm handshake. They often say a lot about whether a man is trustworthy, confident, and one you may potentially like to do business with one day. The most powerful lesson to me that I learned was to give back. At some point in life, everyone was given some form of help in one shape or another. That hand, no matter how big or small, helps us to move forward in some direction. It is vital that we give back to those who are in the same positions we were years ago or even different circumstances simply because someone helped us. The Honorable Elijah Cummins spoke at Coppin State University's convocation this year. And he said something to faculty that even stuck with myself. He said, our children are the living messages we send to a generation we will never see. The program has helped me grow from a young boy into a young man. I am not the same little boy who could barely carry a plastic bag home to put food on the table, but the young man who can afford to. Or the young boy who was so young and naive that he didn't do his homework every night, but the young man who can encourage another young brother to do his homework and be there to assist him if need be. Of course, I cannot forget to mention the great connections I've made from being a part of the program. Men such as Lamar Davis, director of the Choice Program, and Cameron Miles are both great mentors and continuous advocates for me and other young men like me. To conclude, I'm a senior at Coppin State University pursuing a Bachelor's of Art in Global Studies. I'm also a senior mentor with the Our House Program at Coppin State University that mentors incoming freshmen to graduate in four years and adjust their college life. I'm also currently an intern with the Choice Program where I assist and advocate for youth growing up who are similar to myself. After graduating, I hope to be accepted into the Peace Corps where I can travel abroad and assist people who are less fortunate while also learning and sharing my experiences along the journey.